Howdy, Dave Middlebrook here for The Law and You, and I'm really excited about today's episode. It's part two of a series we did on finding your calling. You're gonna get some incredible information. You're gonna be inspired. So join me for today's episode on The Law and You. This is Dave Middlebrook here with The Law and You, where we bring important legal issues into your living room, help you understand them, help you have confidence about them. And today, I'm so pleased to have Mike Tyrone and Susie Jennings, Operation Care International, here with me to talk about an issue that I encounter a lot in my law practice, working with churches and ministries and parachurch organizations, and it goes something like this. Dave, I feel like God has called me to do blank. However, I don't have any money. I don't know how to get incorporated. I don't know about insurance. I don't know about all these things. So I think I'm not going to do it. I'm so excited today because your testimony is a testimony about how if there's a vision, God provides provision. Amen. And so we're going to have some exciting things to talk about. Mike, so good to have you here with us because I know a lot of the stuff that may be not as exciting to some folks, insurance and legal compliance and all that other stuff, but critically important to an organization, right? Absolutely. I mean, you need to have both. You need to have the vision and you need to execute it, but you need to do it the right way so that you don't get yourself in any kind of trouble. Now, Mike, I'm a little intimidated because I know you have a background in television and I'm a novice, I'm a rookie. So share with them a little bit what your TV background is. Well, yes, I sort of grew up in the CNBC uh, television world. I, uh, right out of school, I always had a heart to do that and God opened up a door early on and sort of climbed a ladder when that was starting off and uh, did that for about 12 years uh, and then sort of drifted from the Lord. But then, uh, you know, God always has a way, right? Um, he does. So he grabbed my heart back and I told him, I said, I want to use my gifts now for your your kingdom. And it led to uh, some radical changes. Well, I'm so glad that you <laughs> heeded the call. Tell me how you guys met. Well, um, when he was the general manager of KCBA Radio for seven years, and he heard about Operation Care, so I went there and volunteered actually, right? Yeah. And then that's how we met. And then I was telling him how about, how about Operation Care does prayer for seven hours. Uh, once a month, we will stay from 12 midnight to seven, and we will pray. And then he invited me to go to uh, KCBA Radio and tell your, his people how to pray. Yeah, my staff was telling me, David, about this incredible event at the convention center. And for those who don't know, it's 500,000 square feet of love. It's incredible. Over 20,000 of the homeless come out and they love on them, wash feet. But I kept hearing about prayer, that there was prayer behind this and all night prayer sessions. And I wanted I was attracted to it. I, I knew that God was with Susie and Operation Care International, and I was attracted to the God that was behind it. So I said, let's bring her in here, and I want to talk to her. I want to hear, you know, what she's doing. And I was, and I... Is she the real deal? Yes, she's the real deal. Is she the real deal? That's what you want to know, right? Yeah, and I wanted to see, like, and I asked her, I said, how do you pray all night? And I was a sort of a young, growing Christian, and I didn't understand what that really meant. I do now, but uh, I was attracted to her love for God. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so it, for everybody that's watching, you may go, who are, who are they, what are they talking about? Go and watch the previous episode. You, you really will be blessed to hear Susie tell you more in depth about how she got to where she is today, which is incredible. 46 countries. We started off in her, we started off blankets out of her, the back of her trunk to 46 countries. I'm telling you, watch that episode. But today we're going to focus on kind of here's where we are now and where we're going. Yeah. Okay, so you guys are in 500,000 square feet of the convention center. Yeah. You're all around the world. Mm-hmm. 
How do you manage all that? Well, you take one one step of faith. <laughs> one bite at the and, apple at a time. Yeah, yeah. Time. And really, I mean, if you look at Susie's uh, journey, her faith journey, you said this in the first show, and it really grabbed my heart. You said, if God would have showed you, Susie, the whole story, right? When, he, when God told her, go bring blankets to the homeless, mm -hmm. that was a faith test at that moment. Would she obey? She sure. did immediately. Right. And then God would continue to stretch her faith. Right. And now she's at a point where God has trusted her with a vision to go to all 50 states, 200 plus countries by 2022. We want to scale. We want to do exactly what we do in Dallas, but do it everywhere. And then we want to follow it up by the biggest evangelistic celebration in the country. So this is a huge vision. And when she shared it with me early on, a couple of years back, yeah. I just said, well, that's beyond me, yeah, yeah. It, you know, but it's not beyond God. Sure. And sometimes when we get caught, we get caught thinking about our skills, what we can bring to the table and who we know and the limited box that we have in our world. We forget to see the limitless box that, that we have access to through God. And uh, we're starting to see that now with Operation Care. Despite the pandemic, David, 46 countries partnered with us in 2020. We had over uh, 23 states do it. And this is during a pandemic. So I know for sure that the vision that God gave Susie, all 50 states, 200 plus countries by 2022, it's it's just a matter of time. So we're, we're walking yeah. out. I can tell you want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it well, you want to say? Well, I wanted you, to to say that uh, it's all about the calling. Mm -hmm. It's all about the calling. When God calls you, you better obey. Obey unconditionally. You know what I mean? It's unconditional obedience. So that's what happened to me when God called me, go and help the homeless. I did not like the homeless, but I obeyed 26 hours after the call was mm -hmm. given to me. So I had two jobs immediately. I was supervisor at Baylor Hospital. At the same time, I became a servant to the Lord and served the homeless at the, you know, mm -hmm. while I was working as a nurse, I became also a missionary to the homeless in mm -hmm. Dallas. You know, the, the calling is a, it's a troublesome issue, right? I mean, I was talking to a young man just recently and he, like I did, he was wrestling with, well, I don't know if I should be a pastor because that to him was the definition of what answering the call was, or if I, and then he had another profession that he was interested in. And I said, you know, I, I used to wrestle with that like crazy. I was raised, I mean, back of the church pew, teeth. That church was on my life and Dave was going to be in a long generations of pastors. That's what he's going to do. And then I went to law school. All right. And I learned something, went to Oral Roberts University. Okay. In Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. One of the, one of the coolest things that I took away from that many things, but one of the coolest things is that they say, go into every man's world. And what that meant at ORU was, if you're a dentist, then you're a missionary dentist. Uh, if, you, if you are a lawyer, then you, you're representing Christ going into every man's world. And so I told the young man, I said, you know, it's not, you can be a minister with many professions, okay? So just keep that in mind. He had never, he'd never even heard that before. So speak, speak to calling for a moment. Tell us how you... I know you had heard a voice, so maybe you're not the person to talk to. I didn't hear a voice. I just had a I had a leaning, and I, I felt like the Holy Spirit was directing and guiding me. And sure enough, as things went down, I ultimately feel like this is absolutely. I can't imagine me not doing what I do for a living, serving Christ with my bar card. Okay, I just can't imagine it. So, Mike, you talk to us about that. Yeah, I think a calling is. You know, I, mean, I heard one person say this. Uh, sometimes the thing that breaks your heart is likely your calling because there's a reason that it's breaking your heart. Mm -hmm. and, and in the spirit of God, right, a calling is an anointing and it's something that God has ordained you. I mean, we all take these great scriptures like Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Mm -hmm. when, for I know the plans I have for you. But there really is a calling on every believer's life and it is what your purpose Yes. Was. And when you know, when you can start to walk in to your purpose, and one thing about God is that uh, Isaiah 20, 20, 22, 22 says, you know, that no door that God opens can be closed. It just can't be. Mm -hmm. And no door that he closes can be opened. So when you feel that God is calling you, you take that scripture and here's what you do. You start to walk it out. And when you walk that out, the doors will open 
because that is your calling, right? Yes, and yes. if it's not your calling, the doors will close. Yes. So what you do is you just start to take steps. And in <laughs> Susie's story, yeah, she she activates faith and she doesn't just wait for provision. She starts to walk it out first. I think many people don't get to their calling because they're waiting for God to line everything up for them perfectly. Mm -hmm. And that is not faith. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you were sharing your story, it truly moved me. But I think it's easy when someone has had as much success as you have had and are having to, to not pause for a moment and go back to, wait a minute, her mom and her had a trunk full of blankets going down under the bridge to hand them out to homeless people. Scary. I mean, that would have been a scary thing to do if you didn't know God was calling you to do that, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and remember at the beginning, I really could not stand homeless people. I <laughs> thought they were violent. They There's were that. violent people yeah. in my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But see, it took the life of my husband. The Lord used that in a way. Satan meant it for bad. The Lord turned it for good. My husband was physically really deteriorating mentally also because mm -hmm. of his illness. So the Lord uh, used his death to awaken me mm -hmm. and uh, to realize that uh, I should not get mad at God, but I should in, in return, I mean, serve the Lord because he had blessed me so much. See, a life of, of the Christian should be blessing and victory. Yeah, amen, amen. So when you guys connected uh, and you, you share a little bit about how you let him know that he was the guy, uh, to come to work to just tell us that story if you don't mind. Well, uh, one day, yeah, you we were um, on the phone. I was calling him because he was my advisor for about 10 years. He, he moved to South Carolina for one year already. And then the Lord just said, call Mike. So I called. I just was giving him um, update about Operation Care, the one day uh, 2020 thing that we're going to do for different countries. And we didn't have any director. So we went through six people that came to the office and interviewed and it was not right people. So I told God, Lord send uh, someone out in the field, just like in Sa when Samuel, Samuel went to Jesse and located you know, the king, the right. new king. Right. So David was the number seven. By the way, we needed the number seven. We went through six and it was not the right person. So I was calling him on the phone. And then out of the blue, while I was talking to him on the phone, he was talking about King David on the, on, in a cave. I don't know why we were talking about King David. We, it was very prophetic too, yeah. like. And then when he was talking, immediately I was transported into a golden room. I was in my office in Dallas and the room became gold, everything gold. And then I was like beamed. And then I heard the voice from heaven telling me it's Mike. Then I screamed, I said, Mike, it's you. You're going to be the director of One Day Movement. And then he said, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I still had uh, all the boxes in our garage and we were making a long-term ch change in our oh, family. How, however, uh, you know, Proverbs 16, 9 says, man has many plans in their hearts, but it's the Lord who directs our steps. Yeah. And uh, what I didn't do, do when I moved to South Carolina is I thought that was the next season of Mike's life. Right. And it made sense to me. Sure. for multiple reasons. <laughs> However, that wasn't what God's plan was. And when she said this, God confirms callings. And I think this is a key point. He, he, he yes. will confirm it. You're not, you, so when you take the time to say, okay, I'm gonna fast pray, I'm gonna seek, I'm gonna seek God on this. He will confirm, and he did confirm, hey, this is the step that I want you to take. And so what, what does that mean practically? Here's what happens. Your spouse will completely have peace with the decision. That's one thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Kids, uh, when we went to sell the house, the house sold in 24 hours. He starts taking care of the details. Um, he, a peace comes over you that you're moving in the direction of God. So, so God, when we go to him with the right heart to say, hey, is this really what you want me to do? He delights, David, in guiding us. Like it's a delight for him. Yeah. So it's a, it's a delight to start walking uh, in faith in the direction that he wants you to go. Now, is there, is there um, opposition that comes simultaneously? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. that's also confirmation. So that, we've been doing this together now for a couple of years where we get these amazing victories, yet we have 
uh, opposition. And this is part of what happens when you're walking down the road that God wants you to walk. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I was telling the guys at lunch today, they asked the question, which I get asked a lot. And how in the world did you become a lawyer with a law firm that works with churches and ministries and parachurch organizations all over the country? And I'm like, well, it was pretty simple. Uh, now, again, everybody in my family knew, believed, my grandmother in particular, that I was going to be a pastor. There's just no question in their mind. And, uh, and so I went off to law school. My dad was kind of like, sure, whatever. What a great experience. My clerkship, which was the, is the thing that you do between your first year and your second year of law school, was at a law firm. And I, I did not know this was at a law firm and they represented one of the largest ministries in the country. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was telling the guys at lunch, uh, he would have been the Bono of my family growing up. I mean, when I met him, I was like shaking in my, but could not <laughs> believe that I've met this guy who is by the way, a client to this very day. Wow. But it was a confirmation for me. I was like, wait a minute. I felt in my heart that God could use me and that he needs me. Yes in this way. And people may not understand, but he understood. And so here I am 30 plus years later going, I can't imagine not doing this, right. you know? So anyway, I think the confirmation part is an important piece of it to be alert and aware and be pray prayerfully seeking the Lord's confirmation in, as, as we move forward. Okay, so we talked about calling, but I, I, I wanna hear uh, how you guys have gone from Dallas, Fort Worth to around the world. I mean, tell me, tell me that journey, just a little bit about how that happened. Well, in 2004, we started Operation Care at the Convention Center. 2008, we became a non, uh, we became an international. The Lord woke me up uh, January 31, 2008. We just finished our event in 2007 at the Convention Center. So January um, 31st, God woke me up and he said, you're going to start a ministry for the poor children uh, around the world. And I said, what? And he said, you're going to start in the Philippines. I said, how could I do that? I'm in America, I don't know. I've been out from the Philippines for a long time. I don't have any connection. God placed in my heart my cousin who, who was the HR head of uh, Central Philippine University where I went to school. So I called my cousin, I said, hey cousin, mercy, uh, the Lord spoke to me that we'll start a ministry for the children in the Philippines, for the poor and the homeless. Children in the Philippines, they live in the marketplaces, in the cemeteries. These are homeless children. And my cousin said, oh, he said, why don't we start in my city here where, where I went to school in the Philippines? And, she, and I said, how many children? She said, 500. I said, okay. So we didn't have any plan. I, I said, how do we do this, Lord? Well, we needed, of course, we needed shoes and uh, we needed food. So the shoes is always there because that was, you know, the Lord um, always put in my heart to do foot washing since we started Operation Care. We always have the foot washing. Okay, can we pause on that for a moment? I meant to ask you about this in the prior episode, but that's fascinating to me. And I, <laughs> the reason it's fascinating to me is I grew up in a church denomination where we did foot washing, which sounds strange to a whole lot of people, I understand, but it's biblical. Yes. Uh, so foot washing was part of what we did. And so I'm curious, who do you, who's getting ministered to when the foot washing happens? Is it the person washing or the person receiving, or both? Both. Yeah, so tell me how that came to be. Well, um, the Lord, with the chairman of the board and myself, we, ha we kind of have the same vision of how we will do the first event in the convention center, that we will serve the homeless, not only with blankets anymore, but far greater than the blankets. And then we just thought of doing the foot washing because it emulates the character of Christ of servanthood and also uh, humility. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then also a very symbolic, wherein you're washing the dirtiest, stinkiest, and smelliest feet in the world, dirty, stinky, smelly, and that's your sin and my sin, Ding, stinky, mm. smelly, dirty, and Jesus still gonna wash it. Wow. Yeah. You know, David, we invited uh, the, the partners from all around the country to come to Dallas in 2019 to watch our event so they could right. see it because right. they were gonna do it the next year in their place. Mm -hmm. So people from New York, Chicago, all over. And the, a lot of them run rescue missions. So they are around, you know, right, pe right. homeless people all the time, however, when they came and walked in the room, 
where our volunteers and our team were sitting there washing feet. I, I was with them, and I, we walked in, and they, they, they were overwhelmed by the presence of God. Some of them had to walk out of the room, okay. choked up, uh, because it was such a powerful thing to just watch yes. that. Yet yes. they were around the homeless 24-7 all they year. Never seen anything no. like they no. never saw anything like it. No, yeah. it, massive. It's about 200, you know, people kneeling and washing feet. And the first event we had in 2004 was incredibly amazing. The head of the American Bible Society sent a one 18-wheeler of 10,000 Bibles. Wow. And then when he came, he attended the event. When he saw the foot washing area, he went outside and then he wept because he said it was so overwhelming to see the love that was, that was uh, demonstrated inside Dallas Convention Center where people washing feet and people were crying. <laughs> Uh, the homeless was crying, and the one washing feet was crying. Well, it's almost impossible the, it to talk was, about it without Yeah, so much amazing it stories is. of how the heart was changed. There was one mother, she didn't want to go to foot washing, but she was afraid to say no to her son, that, you know, because they didn't have a place to go inside. There were so many volunteers. So I think I directed her. She asked me, Susie, where do you want me to go? I said, oh, let's go to foot washing. Mm -hmm. In her spirit, she said, I don't want to go to foot washing. Well, she was afraid. Uh, to tell the son. So she went to foot washing and the Lord changed her heart. Mm -hmm. She wept. She was washing the feet of a guy that that guy touched her shoulder and blessed her. And I think she had something to do with her dad. She had trouble with the dad and the homeless became like a father and she just wept and that changed her completely after the foot washing. Tell me about the first time you encountered foot washing in the ministry. Oh, well, I will tell you, the first time that I saw it, it just blew my way. It just blew my mind. And when you see it in a room where so many people are doing it, um, it really is the body being the body. Yes. I'm, it, there's something about sharing the good news of the gospel, right? It's, but there's something so much more powerful yeah. about demonstrating and showing it. And there's just something about getting on your knees going to the the least of these right like yes. the lord told us yes. and and he, what did he say now that you, now that you know these things do them yeah. and and so to demonstrate the character of christ and to wash someone's feet and to treat somebody with dignity and spend that time with them there is something so powerful about it that literally I can't eat, no matter how many times I've gone in and Susie has seen me I can't keep my composure there and I'll tell you what it is more than anything else the presence of God is there. Mm. I mean, that's the most important thing. Mm. You sense it, you feel it, it's in the room, and, and there's something about it that just says, this is the heart of God. This is who Jesus is, you know? There's so much fear, there's so much hate, there's so much dividing nowadays that when you can just get to the basics of something like washing the feet of the, of the homeless, right? Mm. It just shows God's heart. You know, I, as a kid, I always would focus on the shoes, mm -hmm. okay? And it didn't matter whether they were alligator shoes, you know, if they have alligator <laughs> shoes anymore, but back in the day, fancy dress shoes yeah. or tennis shoes or flip-flops or whatever. At the end of the day, whether you're washing the feet or your feet are being washed, we're all equalized, right? And it, 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 it's the great equalizer. That's what I used to think of as a kid. Well, the armor of God, the last thing that says is feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Yes. You yes. know, so that's very symbolic. And you might ask the question, why do you do Jesus' birthday party celebration? Because it's biblical. You know why? The Bible said, when it says they're called the lame and the poor, because the rich will not come to my, birth, my party. So we said, oh, then we'll make it Jesus' birthday. We're going to call the lame, the poor, the homeless, the... Um, all the people that are not wanted by the society will get them inside convention center. Operation Care will become the bridge between the homeless community and the community. We gather resources, 60 partners, come to the convention center celebrating Jesus' birthday, and then we will serve the homeless and the poor. So it's not a, just a one-day event. So this homeless and the poor could be helped by these different ministries all year round. So that is why we have this birthday party, because it's Jesus birthday party celebration and it's in the bible y'all well mike speak to this uh, I, i'm sure some people watching are like going oh well i live in fill in the blank city and 
you know, everybody here, they, they're, we live in an anti-Christian culture and society, and they would never go for something like that. You're in the buckle of the Bible Belt. So it must have just been green lights, everything you encounter just missed it. Go, 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 right? No. We, no, 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 we hit, no, we hit every challenge that you could. Because yes. remember, wherever God is working, the enemy works yes. too. Absolutely. And so as soon as you start to say, hey, we're going to do, we're going to Salt Lake City, Utah, we're going to China, or we're going, and we want to do it in all 50 states, 200 countries. As soon as you start doing that, he will start to the create division. Yes. yes. So we, we face all kinds of uh, opposition. things, opposition. Uh, yes. Like Paul said, although this great op door of opportunity has opened with it comes great opposition. Give, give me an example. Well, oh, there's there's so many examples. The examples that come up is people try to get you on something legal. Uh, what? Yes. So that you know that That's might surprise you. And when you're in a society right now where good is called evil, evil is called good. Yep. You're trying to hold the line, and you're trying to uh, mm. you're trying to be loving yep. and compassionate yep. and kind. But watch this. Yep. But also never compromise. Right. That you need help mm -hmm. because that is our heart and that's what we want to do. But here's what the enemy comes in. He will try to distort and take those other ones saying you're not being loving, you're not being kind, you're not being compassionate, and then he'll force you to compromise. And that is where you need truth and smart people. And if you're not an expert, I always say this to Susie all the time, you don't need to be an expert. Just know somebody who is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give me an example. Have, give me a give me a real life example of a challenge. You know, it's probably it's probably very controversial uh, what happened. That uh, there's a group of people that that wanted. Uh, I have one committee chairperson that wanted to to be a part of this group of people that is not a part of our our statement of faith says that you know we are for um, one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Marriage and also yeah, marriage yes, and then and also yeah. we are against abortion. So that's in our statement of faith. Well, there was a woman that became a, one of our chairperson, and she wanted to be involved with the people that have the same sex marriage, and it was not conforming to our beliefs. Mm -hmm. So we have to say no. And she got so upset that she uh, told me to return the ten thousand dollars that she donated to us. So I, we returned it, and also she told her friends to get their money. So we did return because we didn't want to compromise uh, what we believe. Because number one, we have to obey what the Word says, regardless of what the world says. We have to obey what the Word, the Bible said. So we have to conform and stand firm on that truth. And look what happened. She left uh, because she said, I'm going to give this to the people that supports this kind of group of people. I said, it's okay. We continue to pray for them. But anyway, the work of the Lord should not be compromised. Mm -hmm. I think it's so helpful to folks that are watching today, again, that feel a calling in their life. And it is easy, I think, for a lot of folks to look at successful ministries like yours and think, well, it just must have been a smooth <laughs> road to get there. And they don't appreciate uh, again, 30 plus years of doing this, I can't point to a single ministry that's successful that hasn't had a bumpy road, hasn't had challenges, and the enemy has not attacked them. Well, that's just almost a signal that they're well, on the right road, absolutely. right? The more we are under attack, the more we know we are in the right place because Satan hates what we do. So yeah. when we are under attack, we know we have to go to the Lord and just ask for the armor of God, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit, shield of faith, girdle of truth, and the feet shod with the preparation with gospel of peace. So that should be your prayer every day. So, my prayer. So, so you need to pray, 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 right? What you say, right. but you also need to make sure that you are prop properly, have the right people who are smart, who can protect, and God has people. So what we want to do is make sure that you have people, because here's the thing, even something like social distancing, uh, you're going to be under a spotlight. 
if you're coming in and you're coming in under the banner of Jesus, right? right, right. The spotlight's coming out, yeah, right? Yeah, and and everything's going to be, the light is going to shine on and they're going to try to find something. Hey, you're not six feet away. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. So you just have to really be careful with the details. Yeah, that's right. Careful yeah. with the details. Speaking of details, I think anybody that watches the prior episode and hears the story about how this all came to be and then what we're talking about today they're going to want to know more about you guys. Okay, so... so. Well, uh, you could connect to our uh, website at opcare.org, O-P-C-A-R-E.org. Our event in December is December 18, Dallas Convention Center. We're occupying half a million square feet, 500,000 square feet. Well, and we, we usually have about 3,200 to 3,700 volunteers. But because this is still kind of like pandemic, we don't know yet. But we, thousands still come because last year we were unstoppable. We were in 46 countries. We did three events December 19 in one day and also 46 countries, joint forces and 23 states. So unstoppable because the work of God could not be stopped by anyone. The birthday of Jesus will continue. And this is just the beginning. So this, next year, it will culminate 50 states, 200 countries, which will be, the whole world will be evangelized in one day. It's called Uniting the world for Christ in one day. Unity is the theme. And then hashtag one day billionaires, because in one day billions will come to know Christ. And hopefully Jesus will come very soon. So if somebody's watching today and they want to connect with you guys uh, through your website, they want to send an email, wh wh how do you yeah. invite folks to volunteer and be a part? I'm glad you asked. Uh, go to opcare.org. You could look on there. You can learn more about us. And then you can, you know, just say, God, how, what can I do to be a part of this? And God will tell you. I mean, we need everything. We need people to... To, to volunteer, we need prayer warriors, we need people, we need funding. Uh, we, If you're a church, it doesn't matter where you are, we're going to be in all 50 states. So you can see where we are, you can see where the hole is, and then you could just ask God how you can be a part of it. But I would go to that site, I would learn more, and then I would pray and just say, hey God, I want to be a part of this. This is going to be there's a reason it's called movement. I want to see actual movement in a movement. Yes. And sometimes there's movement here. God, see, God is blowing this and God is moving this. And uh, we're going to be in all 50 states and we're going to be in 200 countries by 2022. And, I, and if you're in Dallas, you happen to be watching this in Dallas. Dallas is so important. Dallas is the epicenter. In 2022, we're either going to be in the American Airlines Arena or the Dallas Convention Center in the evening. And this is going to be an evangelistic celebration where, where, where unbelievers get to watch believers act like Christians. Wow. That's, that's, that's fun. That's incredible. You. That's incredible. Thank you both for sharing your heart, sharing your story with us today. I believe people are going to be inspired, people that are out there wrestling with their calling, wrestling with what God has for them to do. And I know I'm inspired and I look forward to being at American Airlines Center in 2022 to celebrate with you all. And uh, thank you again for coming. Before we end, I want to leave you with this verse that said, Proverbs 19, 17, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Could you imagine lending to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you guys have just blessed me today. And I believe there's people out there that are watching that they're going to be encouraged. They're going to be emboldened. They're going to really wrestle with what their calling is and get in that groove because there's nothing greater than being in the lane that God, God created you to be in. Yes. And so, again, thank you. I'm so excited that you're in our neighborhood here in Dallas-Fort Worth. And, mm -hmm. and I look forward to being at American Airlines Center. 2022, okay, yeah, and seeing yes. what's going on. And thank you for watching The Law and You. And I look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Middlebrook.